Hi guys, welcome to the second episode. This time I would like to follow where we ended. So last episode we went to the initial access vector or attack surface of enter ID. And today I would like to focus on the following steps in the attack chain and it's lateral movement and persistence. So let's start. So after the last video, I was having a conversation with my coworker and we were speaking like that maybe I have uh, forgotten to mention like why the attackers, they are doing the attacks. And he was right. It's very important because when we know why they do that, we know what to protect, what kind of attacks they will probably use and you know, many attacks, they don't need to end with global administrator or domain admin account compromised. Maybe to reach the target of the attackers, just a regular user with access to the right documents is just enough. Okay, so what are the goals of the attackers? They mostly have financial motivation. So if we look on on-premise environments, we can see that mostly they use ransomware. So they encrypt the data, they steal part of the data, and then they blackmail the owner that if you don't pay us, you will never see your data because they are encrypted and only we have the key. Or if you don't pay, we just we will just release the copy of the data which we have, and we will release it to the public, which will cause you a damage and some uh, regulator fees or penalties because the private and uh, personal information will be released. Okay, so this kind of like ethics, it works on on-premise environments, but not so much in Entry-ID or in Office 365 because most of the documents, they are protected against the encryption mostly the services or mostly the stuff which is provided as a service. So it's Exchange Online, SharePoint, OneDrive. All of it, it has some version control. It has local copies on the computers. And as well, it has some double trash. So if even if you delete the data, it's still recoverable. And as well, Microsoft says that if you will delete the data, Empty the trash bin, then still they have like one week, which will, and still Microsoft will be able to recover the uh, data for one week more. I don't know if this last uh, functionality is real or working, but I've read it. So, for this kind of services, I guess so far ransomware attacks is not suitable. It can be suitable and it's happening against the Azure resources like storages, virtual servers. Yeah, that's that's the same story like on on-prem. But for the Office 365, like the software as a service, it's different. Of course, there has been some proof of concept from several researchers, but still we haven't seen it in the world. So maybe something will happen in the future, but so far it's not uh, working against the cloud environment. The next motivation, again, financial can be to do business email compromise. We see a lot of these scams going against our customers and we have been already going through, I don't know, several like 30, 40 cases where some companies have been stolen or their finance has been stolen in business email compromise. Mostly it was CEO fraud and sometimes it was uh, fake invoices, but a little bit more sophisticated because the attackers, they got into the communication. They were like men in the middle and they were uh, editing or modifying the communication which was going between the seller and uh, the buyer. And after the seller just shipped the items to the buyer, buyer paid the invoice, but the invoice was faked because the man in the middle just changed the invoice and the buyer sent the money on uh, to a different bank account. But that's a different story. And as well, the business email compromise by some reports is one of the like, 
most damaging or most there, there's a lot of money being fraud in this kind of scams. I just had a uh, long, uh, I just had a speech or on one conference against this topic, but uh, unfortunately it's still only in Czech language. It's not translated into the English, so I will just skip it for now. Okay. Another goal can be to do data leak because some companies are open to pay for not leak the data. So the attackers, they breach the company, they have, they bring uh, some copy of their data and then they, they blackmail the company that if you don't pay us, we will release the data. Uh, recently there has been a big case, it was against the Caesars casinos and it's being said that they paid like 13 million dollars not to leak the data the attacker stole. But I don't know for sure if it was just to like stop them leaking the data or maybe they were compromised a bit more because it happened in the same time like uh, the MGM hack where the attackers were able to uh, cripple down or stop the business of the MGM resorts and it took them several days, you know. So it was the same group. I don't know what are the, what were the details, but it's like I said. Okay, so the one possibility can be to blackmail the company or maybe blackmail the individual because if you will break in into someone's emails, maybe you can find some secrets the person doesn't want to reveal and you can blackmail the individual as well. Probably if you will, back, uh, if you will breach someone with uh, in higher hierarchy, like some uh, director or president of the big enterprises, they will be able to pay like reasonable amount of money to the attackers. And then there is the espionage because, you know, the companies, they can, they don't want to, they don't want their data to be leaked because of the you know, reputational problems. But on the other side, for some companies can be so in, uh, interesting for some parties, which can be like APTs or some other government hackers, that they will just buy the access or they will buy the data which were stolen. Then we have some criminals which are specialized in initial access brokers or initial access broking. And it's like that they break in into the company, but they don't do anything to the company. They don't exfiltrate the data, nor uh, they uh, modify any configuration. They just only have the credentials, the access, the data, the access, the accounts, and then they sell it on forums. And we call them initial access brokers. And then we have some other motivations which are not like financially based. So someone can just hack companies because it's a challenge to break inside the company or it's prestigious uh, in the community of hackers. Or it can be some kind of revenge to someone you know who did you something bad. And for some it can be just entertainment. It can be how to pass the free time. So, so many times it can be like a mixture of all of the goals I have mentioned. So let's let's dive in into the lateral movement. So why should we like speak or focus on lateral movement? That's because, as I've told you, maybe someone just bought the uh, regular accounts or regular uh, credentials to access some company. But his goal is to do the ransomware or to steal the data, but the first person doesn't have the privileges or doesn't have access to the data. So you have to move laterally in the environment to reach your goal. And the lateral movement can be various. So you can move between the users, you can escalate from a user to admin, you can move from user to device, to other devices, to servers, or you can control the whole tenant. And as well, you can go from one tenant to other tenant that's mostly called like supply chain attacks. Or you can breach from breaching the enterprise cloud, you can breach the personal computers of the users or of the employees. 
or you can jump from the cloud to the on-premise Active Directory. So these kind of movements are possible and it depends on the goal of the attacker, what he wants to do. And to reach your goal, it doesn't mean that you have to do just one hop, you will have to do several hops probably. So let's speak what kind of hops can be done and how can they be done. So at the beginning, we can do something like user privilege escalation. So it means like staying with the user account, but bringing or have, giving yourself more permissions with the user account. So one of the things the researcher has realized that as we spoken last time, so entire ID works with OAuth, with the tokens. And you have access and refresh tokens, which are scoped to the application, to the user and to some permissions. And if you have token to access exchange online, you cannot like change it for access to SharePoint. You can just use it to access the exchange online. But Microsoft has some like feature which, co which is called family of client IDs, which breaks this like security barrier. And it, it allows you to exchange one refresh token for some resource to for a refresh token for another resource. Mm. It's not uh, aligned with the specification of OAuth. It's something Microsoft has implemented. It's proprietary and it's quite insecure, but it is like it is. And under the link, you can find more information. Then if you breach a user, you get access to OneDrive SharePoint email. And maybe if you will go through the, through the stuff, through the data, which he has there, maybe you will find some passwords in his email mailbox, or maybe you will find some Excel with passwords or Excel with SharePoint links, which will give you access to other resources as well. Then we have self serve password reset portal. So you can reset user's password to get more privileges because maybe for, at the beginning, the attacker has uh, just an a uh, refresh token or just access token, which will be invalid in 60 minutes. So you have to like escalate your privileges to be, to have persistency, to be able to access the user account anytime you want, not to be just limited to the 60 minutes. And then for example, you can have, or you can get a compliant device because uh, some conditional access policies can prevent you to access some stuff if you don't have the compliant device. Then we can laterally move from user admin or user or admin to the PC because maybe some data they are stored just on the PC. So we can do something like OneDrive data poisoning, uh, which I will demonstrate soon, or Microsoft Public Automate or RDP into the computer with the user account because in Enter ID you can use your identity to access RDP of computer where the user has RDP privileges, or you can do some Intune policies to infiltrate or run custom software on all the devices which are in the tenant. So these ways you can jump from just online identity to some device or get control on the, of, over some device. So as I told you, I have one demo. Uh, it's about the uh, movement from user to PC. And last time I demonstrated the 365 Steeler. And I told you that 365 Steeler has some more like possibilities or functionality. You can do more or you can do with the tokens, which the 365 Steeler has, you can do more stuff, but this stuff is like implemented in uh, graphical user interface way, so it's easy to use it. So you can send some mails from the victim's uh, account or for, from the victim's mailbox, which will be valid. Uh, the anti-spam solutions will not stop it. So you can do like phishing to other users, or you can upload some files into the victim's OneDrive, or you can create some Outlook rules and forward some emails into the external email or just uh, move them into the other uh, folder so the real user doesn't see it and you as an attacker can like do some kind of business email compromise and scam it. So this time we will focus on the uh, OneDrive poisoning because if we 
check what's inside uh, OneDrive of the user, we can usually find there are some doc documents and Excels. And one of the possibilities is to change some Excel file or mm, doc uh, Word document and add a macros there. So some kind of macros malware. So next time the user will open it and we can see it from the last modified date. We can see what kind of files the user is accessing often. And when, next time when they open it, they probably will run the macro and compromise their own computer. Or this time I can see that there are some shortcuts in OneDrive, which is great because we can put some malware inside the shortcut, which I'm going to demonstrate. So if I'll download the shortcut, I can see that uh, probably from some security reasons, browser hasn't changed the uh, suffix to the link but I, will, I can do it by hand. And if I will see what's being run when you click or run the shortcut, we can change it. We can change it to some PowerShell syntax or PowerShell script. So if user will click on the link, instead of opening the uh, edge, it will just run some PowerShell script. And right now we can upload the link file to the user's OneDrive so it will replace the original link file. And if we will switch to the victim's computer, we can see the file has been uploaded or updated. And if the victim just runs the link file, you can see for a brief moment, there were like a command line window, which just disappeared. And also the edge just opened because one of the last actions of the PowerShell file, it's like open the edge so the user doesn't see any difference. And as well, still the icon of the link looks the same. So user cannot say that the link has been changed. No, no one will notice it because it's normal that you never like go through your links and uh, just do some uh, forensics if they haven't changed. You just want to work with your data. So, but now, the computer is uh, compromised and we can see if we would jump again on the, to the attacker's computer that right now the attacker has uh, like VNC session to his, com uh, to his uh, computer from the victim's computer. So that's just a demonstration and you can imagine what all the stuff the attacker can do with that. And this is one way how to like easily get from just cloud account access to control someone's device. Then there can be the other way that the attackers, they control some device and they don't, they want to get some user identity. So what you can do, and I've showed it last time, I believe that you can loot, or you can be looking on the device, what kind of secret information it's stored there. So it can be cookies, web cookies, it can be primary refresh token, it can be refresh tokens, access tokens, and you can just re reuse it. And one of the things is that, uh, and what we see in most uh, incident response, that the users, they, or the administrators, they use domain administrator to service the computers. And I believe that in ID environment, the, uh, administrators will use global admin or some privileged user which will be admin on all the devices. So what you can do or what attacker can do is to break something on the computer to force the victim to go to the admin for an help. And when admin comes to the computer and logs in, the attackers, they will just steal the tokens which will, uh, uh, which will uh, which will occur on the victim's computer. And then if, for example, there is some developer on the device, you can be looking for some application secrets. And that's another demonstration I will demonstrate soon. So then we have some kind of movement between PC to PC. So if you have like, if you managed or attacker managed to get uh, access to global administrator or some user which is admin on all the PCs, he can use PSExec, like on regular on-premise Active Directory. And even in the computers, 
are connected just to enter ID, so they are not hybrid joined, they are just enter ID joined, still the piece exec works well. And usually the antivirus programs won't stop you because it's a it's a legit for application. Or still there works like uh, NTLM relay, oh, not NTLM relaying, but Kerberos relaying. So you can see it or find more information in the last link. And the most important and interesting thing is that this kind of lateral movement, PC to PC, while using the Android users, is not under the conditional access nor MFA um, protection. So then there is a lot of movement from user to user or admin. So again, it can be OneDrive poisoning because you can poison for if someone shared you a folder, so you can poison his folder or you can poison SharePoint library or you can do phishing within the organization because once the attackers do phishing in the organization is it's much more harder to protect the users because there is, for example, no external mark on the emails. The emails, they come from regular users. They know the attacker, he has already access to the regular conversation or communication between the users. So he can follow with some existing email conversation. So the emails, they look more legit and it's harder and you have to be set more suspicious uh, to all the uh, communication to be able to like realize that uh, someone's account has been breached and that the email which comes from your colleague is a phishing, not a regular email. And then maybe the user has uh, user can have some uh, roles in Enter ID which gives him possibility to like escalate his privileges. For that, I have that uh, I have demo of application misuse, which I would like to show you. Again, it's nothing new. I'm just like following with the stuff the other researchers did. Maybe I add some uh, knowledge of myself or my experience to the demonstrations to be more real. So imagine that we have a regular user. And if the, the regular user in Enter ID can do or can access Enter ID uh, at Enter Admin Center, even it's a regular user. Of course, this functionality can be disabled, but by default, it's enabled. So the regular user can see all the app registrations. And he realized that there is one application he's owner of. And once he's owner of some application, he can possess the identity of the application. So if we will check the permissions of the applications, we can see the application has several permissions and different types of permissions. Uh, there are two types, like delegated and application. Delegated means that the application can have these permissions in case some user logs inside that application. And the application type of permissions means like this application has these permissions on its own. And for example, if there is same permission, just of different type, for example, like the first permission, false, read, write, all. If it's delegated, it means like you can, the application will have access to the user who looks in. So he, the application can access his files and files he has access to. But once we activate the privilege of type application, the same privilege of type application means like the application can access all the files in the whole tenant. So it's much more powerful and it doesn't require that anyone logs inside to that application. So if some user is owner of application, which has some application added privileges, he can like log in as that application. And to be able to log in as that application, he just needs to add some secret as I'm doing in the demonstration. So right now we added secret and if we copy, copy the secret, uh, the application ID and tenant ID, we can access some data in the tenant. So I have already prepared myself some script. So I just uh, pasted uh, the secret, the application ID, and now I'm adding the tenant ID. And with this PowerShell script, we will log in site as the application. And once we are logged in, we can, for example, read all the users in the tenant. 
which was possible. So next, to demonstrate, we can go through all OneDrives of all the users, as we did. It's just a demo team, and so just one user has one drive. Otherwise, we would see all the files from the whole company. And then there is as well like download link to download all the files. Or we can, as we have the read-write permission, we can change the files, delete the files. As well, we can go through all the mails of the whole company. And for example, we can look for emails which were sent from my email address to that uh, demo tenant. And we see that under one user, there has been found, there has been three emails and we can read the emails and save them emails, export the emails, do whatever we want. So that's it. That's how a user, which is a real user, can get access to more data, for example, in case that he is owner of some application in Office 365. So just let's delete the secrets because the admin can go through and see if there is any secret. But the thing can be a little bit more complicated and a little bit more um, opa opaque. For example, uh, there, are, there is two types like application registrations and enterprise applications. Uh, yeah, this kind of stuff would take like another hour to like to go through that more in more detail. But app registration means like uh, it's more like a prescription of an application and enterprise application is an instance of app registrations. So the same application can be found in enterprise applications. And if we open it, we see that uh, there are no secrets. Okay, the owner is the same, is same, but there are no secrets. The permissions are the same, but we cannot add more secrets to to ourselves. So maybe we cannot like have the identity in case of enterprise application. But that's not the case because you know we can find it in GUI, but if we will go to the REST API and we will go through the service principle, we will find that there is a, uh, there are, there is an API to create the secrets even for enterprise applications. If we will try it in the graph, We will get an error because we are not like we don't have permissions to use the graph application. But look, what does the Office Entra admin panel do? It does the same. So I will show you what we will do. Again, I have prepared myself a script. We will copy the application ID and we will find the token which we have in web interface of enter id and use it to amplicate our PowerShell commands and now you will see that we are able to use the same rest api we weren't able to use in the browser like from the graph explorer so right now we can read the, permit or the information of the enterprise application and with another REST method, we can add ourselves a secret there. So you can see that right now we have the secret, which we can use to log in as the application. So we will try to provide it to the last script and to go through the script again. You can see we are logged in and we can get the users and and we were able to get the users. So we can use secret, which is registered on app application registration, or we can use secret, which is in enterprise applications. But what's nicer about the enterprise application secret is that you cannot find it in GUI like an admin. So for that, you can, you have to go through the REST API to be able to find it or use some added application which will like show it to you. Yeah. So if we, if we are under application registrations and go through the secrets, there is no secret. 
And if we try to find the certificate and secrets under enterprise applications, there is no like no blade options for that. So actually for an less skilled administrator, the application is invisible. But if we will run again the REST API, you can see that there is the password credential added. And as well, we can delete it through the REST API as well. So let's move on. So another type of lateral movement can be between the enter ID and Active Directory on-premise environment. So for that we can, or the attacker can misuse Cloud Kerberos Trust, pass, do the password reset if the password synchronization, synchronization is like uh, both ways, or can use Intune to infiltrate or like provide local computers controlled by Intune with some custom application, custom script or add some user to the administrator groups. And yeah, that's it. So it's not so difficult. It has some limits. I recommend you to use the, or go to the first link from Dirkan. It's a great article. And then we have the like reverse way that if someone in, uh, infiltrates the Active Directory, uh, he can move to enter ID environment. And there are several, uh, several ways. The best is the link, which is just on the slide because there's it's very, it's a, uh, it's very detailed on the, on the stuff, but there are several ways you can see Azure, like to infiltrate or compromise the Azure Active Directory Connect, uh, Azure Active, uh, Active Directory Federation Services, Path Through Authentication or seamless single sign on. Each way has some possible, some, advantages like for example some uh, ways can act, attack just hybrid users some can attack local or cloud users some can give you a mfa claim so you will probably go to the conventional access policies some can work like in offline scenario for example the golden summer so you just infiltrate the rt directory federation services server take the token signing key and later on anytime you can create yourself some of the tokens which you can exchange at enter ID for like enter ID session under any user you just pick. So then we can go between cloud cloud to cloud. So there has been a discussion about the uh, enter Azure Active Director Cross Tenant Sync, which is a new functionality right now. I guess it will be renamed to enter ID cross tenant sync, which just copies users between different clouds, or you can misuse GDEP. Like it's not a typical way, but sometimes the attackers, they can find out some tenant, which is like a partner to other tenants, like supply chain attack. For example, our company, we are CSP partners and we have delegated access to other tenants of our customers. And if someone would reach us, which is like something we are doing what we can to protect against. And again, and, and as well, it's my like nightmare. If someone would breach us, it would mean he can access all of our clients. And that's the most dangerous and most catastrophic scenario. So the companies, they should go through the GDEP partnership and look who, who is their partner, what kind of privileges he has, because it's not like that their ten if their tenant is compromised, they will be screwed. But maybe if their partner's tenant will be compromised, they will be screwed as well. Because the attackers they know that if, will go, if they will go under after the many service providers or many security service providers, it's like hey, you, you hack one company and gain uh, and gain like fifty companies. So it's very rewarding for them. So that was the part with the lateral movement and let's start with the persistence. Persistence is about like maintaining access in the environment for as long as possible. You know, so why, why would the attackers like to do that? Yeah, it doesn't mean like that 
every time there is some kind of persistence because, for example, the goals of the attacker has been uh, successful or accomplished and they don't need to maintain any access to the victim's uh, environment. But, for example, if, they, if their goal is long-term espionage, then probably they want to be hidden in the environment as long as possible because they want to access the new information, new data, and they, if they put some effort into the uh, compromising the company or the network, because I think that requires more, or that requires most effort. It's much harder to get to get initial access vector than to have persistence to stay undetected. Okay, never mind. So they can use it for long-term espionage, or maybe if someone just uh, breach some company and want to sell the access on some forum to some uh, buyers, it will take some time to find the right buyer. It can take week, month, a year. Even a year, it's not a problem because from breaches we have been like going through or doing incident response, we could see that the access of the client or the, of the victim was being sold on the forum for a long time, really long time, like months and even more than one year. Or for example, the attackers, they are blackmailing the victim and if the victim won't pay them, they know that the data, the data they have stolen is not enough. So they will return to the environment, ransom or steal more data or encrypt more data to make bigger push onto the victim to force them to pay. And in the old days, like of, of the on-prem environment, the life was easier because just every user has some username and password. And if user was compromised, you just re reset the password. And it was more or less, it, that was it. But with Enter ID, it's a little bit more difficult because in last episode, you, saw, you have seen that uh, there are different application methods. So you can, you have to go through more steps once the account is compromised. And one of the thing is that if you reset the password, it doesn't mean that all the tokens will be revoked. So maybe if the attackers, they stole, they have stolen tick, uh, tokens uh, made from Windows Low 4 business or Fido, they st they will survive the password reset. So you have to do the uh, you have to do the revoke sessions. But that's not enough as well because the attacker has different um, different persistence. So you have to go and find the persistence they just did. So I can show you how the persistence can look like. So let's imagine. We are attackers and we have stolen tokens, uh, session cookie. We have stolen session cookie, for example, from Evil Jinx uh, no, phishing. Or maybe we have stolen it from a victim's computer. And we have that web session cookie. So if we will put it into the browser, we will, we will have like an active session. But the problem is that if the user signs out or resets the password, or revoke the sessions, we will lose the access. And that's not good. Like you want to have persistence. So what to do? Okay. We can go to the account of the victim and maybe we can add some more like application methods. For example, if we see that the user use FIDO keys, we can add, we can add a FIDO key or we can add an applicator app. So let's start with the authenticator app. So we can add second factor to the user. It's a second factor, it's not a first factor. So we cannot sign in into the user with that MFA, but we can use it for different stuff, like for example, search, search password reset. And then we can add another FIDO key. And what we can do is that we will name the new FIDO key the same like the old FIDO key. And Enter ID will not prevent us with that. That's 
I would say it's pity because then it's really hard for the user and for the admin to say like which FIDO key is the real one. Okay, if you have five users, not so it's not so difficult. But if you have tenant with one, two, three, four, five thousand of users, oh, that's that's a kind of hell. So you you see now we have two FIDO keys, which are which has identical name. So if we will go through the details, there is the date uh, date registered. Okay, that's important because with that we can uh, differentiate between the keys and uh, with the. AHGUID doesn't matter that it's not available yet because it's not available yet. It will be provided and it will be the same because as an attacker, I use the same file key, like the same mark, same product. And that's nice because right now we can sign in anytime as that user and have FIDO claim in our token. So if we will go to the enter admin interface and see if there are any devices, we can see that there is one device of that user as well. And to do the privilege escalation and as well some kind other kind of persistence, which I will explain you very soon, is that we can, for example, take the comp uh, attacker's computer and we can rename it and we will rename it the same like the legit user's computer. We will restart the computer, so the computer will have the new name, and then we can join the computer to the enter ID. So with that, the attacker will receive a compliant device. So he can pass through more uh, conditional access policies. And that's the stuff like I told you at the beginning uh, with the phase lateral movement. So it's kind of privilege escalation under user. And we can add the computer to rent right because we can log in as the user with the file key we just registered. So you see now the device will be joined into the enter ID. And by default, the user who adds the device to enter ID stays as an administrator of the device. So we can change the user right now on the computer and log in as the user and log in with the FIDO key as well because it's convenient, easy and it gives us like claim with authentication method which is phishing resistant. And once we are logging for the first time if the company uses it, Windows Hello, we will be uh, presented to register the Windows Hello for Business or Windows Hello on this computer. It can look like like not that it's not handy, but it is. It is very much because Windows Hello for Business is an application method. So if the user will try to see his application methods. Takes some time to load it. So he will go to see his authentication methods and finds out that there is Microsoft Authenticator, which is a legit one. Uh, there is the Authenticator app, uh, time based one time password, which is not legit, it's the attacker's one. And then there are two FIDO keys, one legit and one attacker's one. But there is no Windows Hello for Business. I don't know why why there isn't any Windows Hello for Business because it's a legit authentication method. But if we will go to Enter A and look different way on on the user, or firstly look at the devices, we will see that right now there are two devices. One freshly added. That's the attacker's machine, and the name is the same like the legit one. And after some time, the attacker's machine will receive the compliant mark because it's compliant. It has antivirus, it has firewall, it's updated, it has BitLocker, so why not? And okay, and if we will look from the administrator perspective on the enter ID and we will go under the user of Diego and look on his application methods, we can see 
some more application methods. And that's funny because now we can see Windows Hello for Business. I don't know why the user cannot see the Windows Hello for Business for himself, just the admin sees it. And it's important because Windows Hello for Business means that you can look inside the user's profile or user account with Windows Hello for Business. So as I've told you, so now if admin realize that the user Diego has been compromised, he can reset the password He can revoke the sessions, so you would you would think, okay, now everything's fine because uh, the attackers are out. But that's that's not true. The attackers are still present, and they have several ways to get. They have several ways how to get the user's identity. So they can go to the portal office and sign in. And they can use Windows Hello for Business and it will be signed with Windows Hello for Business. Or they can sign in with FIDO keys. You know, so there are two possibilities right now. And I will show you the third, and that's the self-serve password reset. So we will go under the uh, portal again. Okay, we can sign with the FIDO key to demonstrate you that we can sign with FIDO key as well. So done. And now let's try the third method. And that's the self-serve password reset portal, I told you. So we will pick, we want to sign in as Diego. But other way to use the password. And then we say, hey, we forgot our password. So we provide the captcha. And then in the next step, because we still have the MFA, of the from the authenticator, not the authenticator of app, but like the software out OTP software OTP, and we can provide it, and that's enough to receive the password. So that's the third way how to get into the user's profile. Of course, this third way is very loudy because it will send email to administrators to the user that the user password was changed, and as well, the user won't be able to log in back with the like real password, but. We can use this reset of password just to get into the user profile and to create a different persistency. So once the, uh, the admin will reset the password and revoke the sessions, the, attack the attackers will again have some Windows Hello for Business or FIDO keys implemented, or maybe some passwordless. So you see, persistence is fun. And the same thing, you can do it in CLI. You know, you, you can say that, for example, like for attackers to have a separate virtual machine for each victim would be very resourceful. So they would require some uh, CPU, RAM, hard space. So you can do the same in CLI way. And the resources will be just few files which will be the private key, the certificates for the device. Because in CLI, thanks to the research of other researchers, we can create a virtual computer, join the virtual computer uh, to enter ID and register Windows Hello for Business for that user on that virtual computer. So all you need to go through are those steps just visible in the PowerShell. Right now, we are going to register the Windows Hello for Business for that user. Uh, now, we should see that there is a new computer connected. And the name is the same, so there are three computers already with the same name. Like, good luck with finding which computer is legit and which who's are not. And I believe that most of the administrators, they will think like, oh, well, there has been some error. All the computers are legit and better not to touch them because we can break something to the user and the user is for example some manager or some director and we don't want to bother him and we don't want to cause him any downtime with this computer and the attacker will be happily living in the entirety for a long time and that's good for example uh, if the attacker is an initial access broker and he's going to sell the access 
He don't want, he don't need to sell like 60 gigs of virtual machine. He will just sell like half a megabyte of data to the wire. And as well, we can join the uh, virtual device to the Intune as well. And if there are no compliance policies for Intune, the device will be compliant. That's great. So right now, everything, everything's done. And we can see that if we will do a refresh, wait some time and we will refresh it, we will see the device, the virtual device is connected in, to Intune and it's, it's marked as compliant. So if we will just close the script to, to be sure that everything what was cached has been purged, run the PowerShell and open the script as well and just do the Windows Hello business sign-in just to demonstrate it, it uh, works. So for that, we just need to go through the last steps over here, which will sign in the user with Windows Hello for Business. We will receive the PRT token and with that we can access anything we want. For example, we can generate ourselves a token for exchange online and with that token, we can go to use it with REST API, but let's check the claims and the token. So at the beginning, I just need to get rid of the blank spaces or black white characters. And then we can go to gvt.ms to see the claims. So we see who is the audience, who is, what's the application, what are the login claims, which is RMS RSA and MFA. So it means like some kind of asymmetric cryptography. And then we will see that there is again as well a claim that the device has managed. It's taken from managed device, which is compliant at the same time. Okay, so the token is fine. If we check the uh, user authentication methods from the admin perspective, we can see that there is Windows Hello for Business three times for the same computer, same computer name, because all the times the compute device ID will be the different because it's a different object. If we will check in tune, we will see that there are three computers as well. There is one more, but it's from different uh, uh, different drives. Okay. So that was the CLI way. So you can see that with CLI way, it can be much faster, it can be automated, and the result will be just healthy make of data, which will be easy to sell on some uh, instructor broker forum. And then we can do persistence on user, so it can be uh, what I just said, it can be some kind of cookie PRTRT application password, uh, add the authentication methods, add some mail flow rules, or create some power apps to the user. Like, I don't have any experience so far with power apps. I'm sorry, but I've read some articles. Again, it's uh, like huge functionality. And uh, I've seen that there has been some issues and some APDs has already used it in the wild. and the compromised company they knew they are compromised but still it took them seven months i guess seven months before they realized how the attackers are returning to their environment so you can see like the things are very complex and it requires a lot of knowledge and the stuff you don't know that you don't know it's the most dangerous one then you can have persistence on the computers more or less it's the same, it doesn't matter if it's if the computer is enter ID join or if it's an prem PC. Still you can use some malware scheduled task, user accounts, use some legit applications like uh AnyDesk, TeamViewer, uh VNC, doesn't matter, you name it, you know. Then you can have persistency on tenant and it can be done with for example creating uh fake AD Federation services uh seamless single sign on with the Kerberos aid uh, enter id uh, active, azure active directory connect account for the synchronization uh custom com, uh, uh 
certifi certification uh, certificate authority or some application which will be registered like I show you with high privileges some user new user or user which will have some privileges like global admin or it's because it's more very obvious it can be user with access to labs passwords or you can add gdip to the uh, to the tenant so there's uh, many ways some of the ways they can be more handy some less for example with the applications i haven't mentioned it but very nice feature with applications identities that they don't uh they don't uh the conditional access is not effective against the application identity like when some application is signing in the conditional access is not applied so you can bypass MFA, some uh, location restrictions, uh, you don't need any compliant device. So it's very nice. And from the from the uh, defenders, it requires a lot of effort to keep it clean and to uh, work well with the secrets. And there's, I guess, the last demo I want to show you. It's about the persistence on tenant while using the certificate authority custom certificate authority so what you see on the background is i'm just downloading open ssl to create custom certification certificate authority which won't be publicly uh trusted doesn't matter because we will create the anchor of trust in the environment by ourselves so open ssl is installed so we will open some script i just prepared which will set up some configuration to create the custom ca so right now we are generating the keys for the author, uh, authority we will create a certificate which we will self-sign Now we will go to the tenant and at first we have to enable a certificate based authentication and as well we want to check that it will be used like or it will be valid like an MFA authentication like that if you will sign in through certificate authority or certificate that you will have the MFA claim as well and what's nice that this kind of application is between the phishing resistant application so you will have strong claims on that so that that one step and the second step is in under the certificate authorities to add your custom ca as a trusted ca for signing application certificates I just have to rename the uh, certif CA uh, certificate to other suffix. And right now it's import. And if we will come back to the attacker's computer, we can we can um, create ourselves a certificate in a name of any user, any user with different with different uh, validity, and access the user anytime we want. So we just uh, published or create a certificate for a global admin account. That's it's done. And to use it, we will open the management console and import the certificate under the current user. done so now we can go to the portal office.com and say yeah we want to sign in and we want to sign in as that user we have certificate for but we are asked for password but it doesn't matter the problem is that we need to wait some more time because we changed the application methods added the certificate authority and it takes like an hour an hour 
for Azure to like refresh or load the new configuration. So right now, if we were to do the same, we can say that use a certificate or smart card and we are presented with the imported certificate. So we just select it. Okay. And we are logged in under the user. And what's interesting about this stuff is, is, as I said, we have the phishing resistant application method. We can create a certificate anytime for any user we want. So it's like a persistence, which is like hard to see. And as well, if you will go under any account, you won't see that they have certificate published or that, that there has been a published certificate because just the attacker, he knows what kind of certificates he has. And the only possibility for the attacker, uh, for the defender is to go through the audit logs to see that the attacker changed the configuration of dedication methods and added some uh, CA. And to go through the signing logs and see that someone has signed in with uh, by using certificates, by knowing that you don't use certificates. You know? So I would say, it's, it is a very quiet method how to stay persistent. Easy method. You, you see that the user, we just sign it in and we see there is no certificate application method because the application method, certificate, certificate application method is enabled on the, the whole tenant. And that's it. You don't see it under any user because just the certificate of certification authority knows how many certificates and in which names has been published. Okay, so we are getting to the end. I have some more observations. From my point of view, I believe that the enter ID will contain the same mess as the on-prem Active Directory has. You know, you just need some time running with the enter ID, one year, four years, seven years, and we will see the same mess. Actually, as we have been auditing some bigger tenants, we can see that there is mess already. And it took just two, three years because a lot of configuration at the beginning wasn't perfect and still it's not perfect. And as the Microsoft, I would say, just uh, choose the path of empower the users that allowed to of creation of many device uh, objects uh groups in the tenants and registration of many applications because the users were able to consent the application on their self on themselves so it allowed to do a lot of mess it can be clean it will just need some effort another thing is that uh even the initial access can be done with OneDrive or GDEP you know I just like I haven't mentioned it in the first episode, but for example, some user from your company will share a OneDrive folder to someone else with the right permissions. And now the, like the third party can alter the files of that user, add some macros, add some applications, or uh, uh, add some malware to the applications. And as the like owner, the user will run it he will get compromised or you can get compromised because your partner who has GDAP access to your tenant will be compromised. And in theory, I was thinking, you know, if I would be an attacker and want to do a lot of mess to the victims, maybe you can do that once you are a global admin of some uh, tenant, why don't they just delete all the other global admin accounts of the tenant? Because what would happen then is like, okay, now you know you have been compromised, but you can log in as an admin to your own tenant because the only global admin is the attacker one. So we will have to contact the Microsoft uh, support. And I'm worried that it will take days or weeks before the Microsoft will like restore your access to your own tenant because they will need, I don't know if they even have processes for that, but they will need some like uh, legal letters or some proofs that it's really your tenant. But 
if the attacker is like causing you a dose that, for example, deletes all the data or blocks all the users, it will take like it will be a pain. Every hour will be a pain. And even so, if they will create your new global admin, maybe the attacker will have script, scripted everything. And again, uh, in few minutes, he will block all the globe of the, all the new global admins. Now, okay. I haven't seen it on, and, and nor I haven't heard about it yet, but just, just a theory I was thinking about that it can be a real pain for the defenders. Okay. So for the summary, you know, attacks on enter ID are happening. That's reality. And the bad part is that I believe it's just beginning. Once they will find out some like, uh, possibilities how to make money from other attacks or more money from the attacks, there will be more and more attacks on enter ID. And enter ID is complex, as I told you, as Active Directory. And I think that there isn't enough people with proper knowledge to defend the enter ID tenants. And right now the configuration is not so mature as it should be. Okay, the attacks will depend on monetization scenarios. And for some attacks, the global admin rights are not always needed because if someone wants to steal some documents, maybe just a regular user is enough. And there is more, okay. The more lateral movement that persistence the attackers are doing, more loud they are, and there is a bigger chance to catch them. But to compromise one user and catch catch the attackers that they just compromised the user and downloaded a few files, yeah, that's that's hard stuff. And the most dangerous are the stuff we don't know that we don't know. And the sooner we stop the uh, attack, the better. Because if we stop the attackers with initial vector under the single user, it's easier to go through the outlogs to see what they were doing under the user. And it's less space to create persistence for them. But once they compromise the whole tenant, yeah, that's, that's a height and seek game and it will be very tough and even like it will take much time and as well, like damage will be much higher already. And then I have some more sources, but you can see some presentations, uh, blogs or documents. Yeah. I would like to thank very much to the guys who are doing the research with the intro ID. And yeah, I will be looking to see you again in the third episode, which will be, uh, which will be about the defense of enter ID environments. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope that you learned something new and see you next time.